Matthew chapter 10, you have Christ <clears throat> choosing his 12 special representatives, his uh, apostles. They are, they are named in verses 1, uh, or excuse me, verses 2 through 4 of <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10. He gave them powers to uh, cast out uh, unclean spirits, to heal every disease and every affliction. And he was going to send them out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is a limited commission because this, of course, is before his death, burial, and resurrection. And they were not to go out into the Gentile regions. They were not to go into the area of Samaria. <clears throat> they were to preach to the Jewish individuals and really prepare their minds for, for the coming of the kingdom. They were to preach the kingdom is at hand. That phrase at hand means near, very close. And so they were to go out and do that, and then Jesus would come, and uh, he would uh, preach in those areas as well. Uh, verses 16 through 23, he talks about the, the problems that they're going to face. It's not going to be easy as they go out, even though they're going to have supernatural powers to, to uh, cast out demons and heal the sick and to do those things. Uh, they're still going to receive persecution. He says in verse 16, they were going to be sent out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, that's a dangerous situation. And so he's basically telling them of the, the, the persecution that they would receive as they went out and preached. Told them to when they're, when they're delivered up, don't be anxious on what they're going to say. Verse 19 and 20, because they would be inspired in their message. In other words, they would be preaching and it would be the Holy Spirit directing that message so they didn't have to, to come up with what they were going to say when they were brought before the authorities. And uh, unfortunately, these verses are taken out of their context and sometimes they're applied today. People claim this <clears throat> for themselves today and that's just a simple mishandling of the Word of God. Uh, People today are not speaking as the Holy Spirit directly guides them. That just does not happen. Uh, this past last week, uh, Josh and I went to a denominational revival. Now, we didn't go there to participate. We went there to observe. And the preacher got up there and claimed that the Lord gave him this message. In fact, in his car on the way over here. The Lord laid this message on his heart, and he could feel the presence of God in his car. And when he got up there and he started to preach, he quoted, or he, he read from two verses and then went on to his lesson. And when he would refer back to the verses, he kept misquoting the verse. He, he, he read from Genesis chapter 12, where it says, In Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And when he would refer back to it, he said, God said to Abraham, in him all the nations of the earth would come. And he said it two or three or four times, totally missing and messing up that verse. But yet he claimed that his message was from God. Now, the Spirit of God is not going to contradict himself. And so uh, that man up there who was claiming a message that he had received from the Holy Spirit of God, was not even quoting the verse right when he was in his preaching. The Bible doesn't say all the nations of the earth would come from Abraham. But that's what he said over and over and over again. So, people today who make that claim are, are number one, they're mishandling the Word of God, and number two, when you really listen to what they say, it doesn't harmonize with the Word of God. The very fact that he was a denominational preacher shows that the Spirit of God was not speaking through him because he was teaching things. He's in an institution that teaches and practices things contrary to the will of God. So uh, this claim is not for anyone today. It was for a spe special purpose here in the limited commission. And then later on in the great commission, in the, when the apostles would uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, and they would be able to preach supernaturally and everything of that nature, and the Holy Spirit would speak to them. 
and preach through them. But we have the Spirit's words found in the Word of God, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit works through His Word. And so they were to not be concerned about what they were going to say because the Spirit of God would speak through them. And he says in verse 22, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures as long as they can hold on will be saved. It's not what it says, is it? The one that endures until it just gets really tough will be saved. The one who endures to the end, to the end, till death, Revelation 2 and verse 10, be faithful unto death. That's the person who will be saved. And he talks about the persecution they will have. He's warning them up front their message isn't going to be popular. Verse 22, they're going to be hated. They're going to be hated for the message that they preach. You persecuted in one town, you go to the next town. And verses 24 through 25, he talks about how that a disciple is not above the teacher or a servant above his master. He said they called the <clears throat> they called the teacher um, the master of the house Beelzebub or the prince of the demons. We talked about that last week. Uh, how much more are they going to insult you, in other words? I mean, if they're going to say this about me, they're going to call me the prince of demons, that my power is derived from Beelzebub, what do they think they're going to call you if you're following me? So, it's, it's something that they were going to face as far as persecution. But he encourages them. He's telling them all this, what they're going to face, and then he encourages them in verse 26. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Verse 27, what I tell you in dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. We talked about that last week, how that this is eternal destruction. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, it's an ongoing perpetual destruction, not annihilation, not being snuffed out of existence. It is eternal, conscious punishment that never, ever ends. And here's the interesting thing. He says this to his disciples, to fear God who's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. He's not talking to people of the world that have rejected him. He's talking to his own followers. You fear God because he's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You know, that's not our main motivation for serving God. But should it be a motivation? You better believe it. It's not our main motivation for serving God, fearing him, fearing punishment. We should be motivated by love and anticipation of heaven. We should, we should long to be with our Lord. And do and have that as our motivation, but also there's a healthy fear of God because He's able to destroy both body and soul in hell and Gehenna. So there, there, there is a balance there that uh, we anticipate heaven. We want to go to heaven. We want to, we want to, we love God and we serve Him out of love and honor and respect, but also fear. And I think that's an element that's being lost. In a lot of places among God's people. In fact, uh, the doctrine of hell is being, for lack of a better term, watered down. That it's not a place of eternal punishment. So, um, there's, a, there's a fear that is there that we're to have. Now, let's talk about the other extreme. The person who only obeys out of fear is not obeying properly either. There has to be a love and devotion that's there. If you're serving God just so you won't go to hell and you don't really have an anticipation of heaven, then you're, you're not balanced. The same way as a person who, who's serving God just to want to go to heaven and doesn't really concern himself about eternal punishment or think they can be lost, that's an imbalanced person as well. There has to be a balance of heavenly anticipation 
and true love and devotion for God, but also a fear and respect and realizing what Jesus said, he can destroy both body and soul in hell. He says in verse 29, And not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. On some people's head, they don't have to number as many hairs. But the very hairs of our head are numbered. Isn't that right, Paul? Even the very hairs of our head are numbered. Hey, I'm getting that way too. So He's, He knows about us, in other words. He's well aware, acquainted with us. That's just a way of saying He knows every hair that's on your head. He knows you inside and out. Psalm 139 is a, a perfect psalm that goes with this. God knows our rising up, our going to bed. He knows our thoughts from afar. Wherever we go, He is there. The omniscience and the omnipresence of God <clears throat> is stated forth in Psalm 139. So he, He's well aware of you. He knows. So He says to them, um, uh, fear not. He already said in verse 26, have no fear of them. He says in verse 31, fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. We're more valuable than animals. We're made in the image of God. Genesis 1.26, we are the children of God because uh, we've obeyed the gospel of Christ. And so there is that special concern that God has for his people. And he says, do not fear. But notice in this, even though he has this special concern and uh, awareness of what is going on, that doesn't mean he's going to shelter them from persecution. They're going to be persecuted in the world. He's not going to deliver them out of persecution. It's going to happen. It's going to come. Verse 32 and 33, Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Verse 32 and 33, is he just talking about when you're baptized? Confessing when you're baptized? What, what's he talking about there in verse 32 and 33? He was talking about a verbal a way of life. You are confessing not only with your mouth, but by the way you live, that you're a child of God. Now, some people, they confess with their mouth Jesus Christ, but they deny him by their life. They live contrary to his will. And that's, that's really, in essence, denying him. Uh, so everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven. You're confessing him. Not only when you confess, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you step into the waters of baptism and you're baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, but you're confessing every single day that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the Lord of my life, and that I am a Christian. And you're confessing that before men. In verse 33, he says, Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. And you can deny without saying a word. You can deny by your behavior that you're a Christian. <clears throat> and Jesus said, If you do that, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. You will not be um, accessing Christ uh, if you live this way. Verse 33 as your high priest and your uh, advocate. Because when we approach God through Jesus Christ, acknowledging Him with our life, He is our high priest, He is our advocate, He is our mediator between us and the Father. He will confess us before the Father. But if we deny Him bef before men, we, we deny that He is um, God's Son, uh, by the life that we live, he will also deny us. And confession, as I said before, is more than just a verbal confession of someone saying, oh yes, I'm a Christian, or oh yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, or have the bumper sticker that says something about Jesus Christ, or the air freshener, or the t-shirt, or the cross on the necklace. 
It's much, much more than that. You find some of the most ungodly, immoral people walking around with a cross on their necklace. And some of them claim to be members of the Lord's church. Or they'll have a bracelet that has some religious significance. Or they'll, you know, they'll have a t-shirt that says something. And, and you can tell by their life they're, they're not confessing Christ. So it's important that we understand that this confession here, and I, if I believe uh, <clears throat> correctly, the language here denotes an ongoing continuous action. You're confessing. It's an ongoing thing that you do every single day. Confessing Christ. Yes. Second Timothy. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse 11. It says, this is a trustworthy saying, if we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. It's very good. Verse 13. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. Notice that verse 12. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. If we endure. Notice that if. That's conditional. If. If we endure. We will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a Christian, who would be reading this before the church at Ephesus, to Christians. And notice Paul included himself in that. Paul says, if I, Paul, deny Him, He will deny me. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That simply means he's not, he's not the Son of God if you are not living the way you should live. He is the Son of God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, whether you live that way or not. Now, for your own benefit and for my own benefit, we better live in harmony with that fact. He is faithful. He cannot deny himself. He, he is who he is. And, and if I go astray and by my life deny him, that's not going to change the fact that he's the Son of God, the King of kings and the Savior. But it will only be uh, detrimental to my own soul. Matthew 10, verses 34 through 39 some surprising <clears throat> words of Christ. <clears throat> he said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Notice three times he uses the, the phrase, not worthy of me. Not worthy of me. And he says in verse 34, don't think that I've come to bring peace on earth, but I did not br come to bring peace but a sword. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. In verse 6, this is a prophecy about Christ. <clears throat> Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. But then he says in Matthew 10.34, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. How do we reconcile those two statements? Or how do we find the harmony that's there? He's the Prince of Peace. When he was born, remember, the, the angel said, peace on earth. But here he's saying, I didn't come to bring peace. What's he talking about in verses 34 through 39?
Right. Right. His purpose was not to bring political peace or the peace of um, no conflict or, or no wars, things of that nature. He came to bring uh, a peace that's between, <clears throat> between God and man. Man is, uh, has become an enemy of God through our own sin. And so Christ came to bring us back together, to reconcile us back to God. And so there is peace uh, in the church. You read about that in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, that there is peace in one body. But it, he says here he's going to bring sword. And the sword denotes uh, conflict or, or division. Uh, I mean, why would that happen? Why would that happen when they go out and preach that you're going to have family members divided? Some won't believe. Some will not believe and obey. You could have a, a husband obey and the wife doesn't, or vice versa. You could have children obey and the parents don't, or vice versa. And you could have any number of a scenario. So he's saying... My message is going to, to bring division. It's going to divide you from the world. And some in the world are going to be your own family members. And they're not going to, they're not going to listen to me. And there's going to cause division there. Verse 35, I've come to sit a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. He's already told him in verse 21, brother will deliver brother over to death and a father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And so there's going to come a, a division because Christ's message, the gospel of the message, demands a, a, an allegiance. In other words, Christ does not tolerate Christianity doesn't tolerate a divided allegiance. Jesus already said in the Sermon on the Mount, you can't serve two masters. You've either got to serve God or the world. And so Christianity, by its very nature, all those who embrace it, believe it and embrace it, all those in Christianity will be one and will have peace. But those who are outside who refuse to believe and obey, there will be a, uh, a division there. There will be people uh, at odds with one another, and even in their own family. I mean, I see that in my family. I mean, how many here, you, you're, you have a divided family, religiously speaking. Some of your members of your family are Christians, and some aren't. And some that aren't Christians are very antagonistic towards uh, Christianity and towards you because you are a Christian. And we are, we're not trying to make enemies, but the nature of Christianity will make enemies. I mean, we're not trying to go out and make people hate us and make people, uh, enemies, uh, our enemies and, and, and things of that nature. That's not our goal, but the very nature of it will create enemies. I mean, in this community, when we stand for the truth, uh, there are people that are not going to like us. I mean, when we, you know, we have visitors and, and we preach on homosexuality and they hope, happen to be homosexual, they'll either repent and do what's right or they won't and be very angry and hate us. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Same way with denominationalism. Same way with anything. If... If we stand for the truth and we don't compromise, talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, or whatever, uh, there are those who are going to believe and obey, and there are those who aren't. And that's just the, the nature of it. And so we have to uh, present the truth in love, but understand that we're going to make enemies when we do that. We're going to make enemies when we do that. And we shouldn't thrill ourselves in making enemies. That's not our goal. 
we're trying to, to make friends with everyone, but those who aren't friendly towards the truth aren't going to be friendly towards us. Then he talks about verses 37 through 39. He, he tells them, here, you're going to have families that are divided. And he says, if you're more loyal to your family than you are to Christ, you're not worthy of me. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Some people will not become Christians because their family will not be converted. Jesus says, that person is not worthy of me. They refuse. They know the truth. They know what is right. They, they know that the denomination they're in is wrong or whatever situation they're in is wrong. They know it. They can tell you they know it's wrong, but they'll, they will not obey because their family won't or because a spouse won't or because their children won't or because their parents won't. And Jesus says, that person is not worthy of me. That person is not worthy of me. Because Jesus' love for him and devotion to him must be top priority. I believe the phrase is true. He must be Lord of all or he won't be Lord at all. He will not tolerate a divided allegiance. And so when it comes, he's, he's basically telling them, when, this, when these problems arise in the family and you have these uh, divided families because of my message, if you love your parents or you love your children more than me, then you're not worthy of me. You're not worthy of me. Verse 38, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. <clears throat> of, course, of, of course, verse 38 is referring to persecution and, and willingness to, to endure persecution. The cross meant death. It meant pain and suffering and death. And if you're not willing to take up your cross, and Luke's account, he says, I think it's Luke's account, daily, take up your cross daily and follow me, you're not worthy of me. If you're not willing to, to make the sacrifice necessary to follow me, uh, you're not worthy of me. I think sometimes we fail to teach people this because we get in such a hurry to get them in the baptistry. And we forget to tell them the commitment that's involved. That they are changing their life and they're turning it over to Christ and they're living for Him or supposed to be. They're supposed to be. Now, of course, that commitment grows as they grow in Christ, but He's letting them know up front, this is what it means to follow me. He says in verse 39, Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you find your life, you'll lose it. What does that mean, verse 39? <clears throat> True direction. He says, if you, he who finds his life will lose it. What does that mean? He's going to lose his life if he finds it. Living of the world and living what he, the way he wants to live, basically. If you... If you find your life, you lose it. In other words, you lose true life, which is spirituality, if you find your own life and you do your own thing. You live your life the way you want to live. You're selfish, in other words. Uh, you, you, you're not living for Christ. You've found your life. You're going to live your life the way you want to. You've lost. You are a loser. I mean, that might sound harsh, but a person might be successful. They might be famous. They might be an actor or an actress. They might have money. They might get fame and notoriety with the world. But if they're not right with God, when they die, they're a loser. They've lost. And, you know, it's sad to go to funerals. In the past month and a half, I've gone to three funerals. And when you go to funerals to the faithful child of God, you know, there's a sense of hope there. And what, what the people talk about is their spiritual life. 
and the things that they did and how that they were committed to Christ. And there's, there, there's, there's a sense of hope and anticipation with that. But then you go to a funeral of someone who was not a Christian. And all that they can talk about is just some things they did in their life. And, and not even speak about anything spiritual because they were not spiritual. And it's so sad. Because if you're not right with God, no matter how successful you might be uh, financially or the way the world measures success, you are a loser. I think that was the whole point of the book of Ecclesiastes that we study. That there's nothing new under the sun. The conclusion of the whole matter is you fear God and keep His commandments because this is all that truly matters. Fame, fortune, notoriety, all those things are vanity. They're like grasping for the wind. I believe that's what Christ is saying there. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Loses his life. What does that mean? Does that mean death? Gives his life over to God. That could include death. It did for every, pretty much every apostle and a lot of the early Christians, it did mean death. You read the book of Revelation, you'll find that physical death. But if you lose your life for my sake, Christ said, you'll find it. You've got it. You understand it. You have salvation. And as a result of that, you're the winner. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're a poor slave like Onesimus, like we studied in our sermon. It doesn't matter if you're a what you do in life, if you're a faithful Christian, then you are a winner. You're a winner. And that's the thing that we need to understand and get across to people. The things that are spiritual are what matter. They will last. They will endure. What's done for Christ will last for eternity. But if we live only for ourselves, we will lose out. Yes. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, very good. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul sums it up like this. <clears throat> so, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, um, that you might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You, you present your body as a living sacrifice, total and complete commitment. And so many people don't get that, or they don't want to get that. I think it's because of the do-nothing no, do effortless religions around us that that mindset has crept into the Lord's church. Very good. Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, that's from their baptism. You're, you're now a Christian. Seek those things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above. Spiritually minded. You set your mind on things above. Not on things on the earth. <clears throat> He says in um, verse 3, For you have died and you, your life is hidden with Christ and God. Verse 4, When Christ who is our life, is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. You get the sense when you study the New Testament that it's a total commitment type of thing. Total commitment. It's all or nothing. That's why when I talk to people before they're baptized, I, I make sure that they understand the importance of what they're doing. Uh, of course, they understand you know, what they're doing, but also the importance of it, that they're making the most important decision of their life. It's more important than marriage. It's more important than having children. You are entering into a relationship with God, and that commitment from your drying off from your baptism to your grave is to live for Christ. And that's not just for preachers. 
That's for every Christian to have that sense of dedication and commitment because Christ gave everything so that we could be saved. He didn't have a half-hearted commitment when he came to earth and when the times got tough, he said, Father, deliver me out of this. I want to go back to heaven. He followed through with his commitment even to death. And if Christ was willing to give all, he's expecting his followers to give all as well. Look at verse 40 of uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. <clears throat> He's going to give them some last minute instructions concerning their, their work. He says, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. So he's saying if they receive you, they're receiving your message. Uh, they're receiving me. And if they receive me, they receive the Father. Verse 41. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. This reception here means a reception of the message, just not of the person, but it's a reception of the message. They would, they would be acting as prophets because the Spirit of God would be speaking through them and their message would bring reward. And because they were righteous persons, and they would be received, that those who would receive them would receive a righteous person's reward. Verse 42, And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. In other words, these little things mean a lot. Little things mean a lot. This, this little bit of service that you give, the, the, those who would be willing to help out and encourage those men who would be going out in a, in a difficult situation and preaching for Christ, even a, a cup of cold water says that person will not lose their reward. They're, they're, they're willing to help out. And those little things mean a lot to God. And sometimes, sometimes people think if they can't do big things to serve the Lord, that then they won't serve the Lord at all. And that's the wrong attitude to have. The little things that we do in, in, in helping and encouraging the people of God and helping and encouraging the work of God, those little things mean a lot. And that's basically, I believe, what he's trying to get across here in verse 42. When they receive you, they receive me, and they receive him who sent me, they receive the Father. You remember what? Samuel, what God said to Samuel when he was grieving because the people were asking for a king to be like the nations around about me, God said to Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So when, when a, a person who is preaching the truth or teaching the truth is, is rejected, that message is rejected, they're not, you're not just rejecting that person preaching the truth. You're rejecting God. Uh, that's, that's how serious it is. Not that that person is anything. That person is just an instrument. He, he is an instrument of God. But uh, you see here, the reception of the person means the reception of the message in verses 40 through 42. Any questions or comments about chapter 10 before we get into chapter 11 just a little bit? Here's, here's a thought question. Now remember, these 12 are going to be sent out on their limited commission to the house of Israel. You notice here they were given miraculous powers. You notice one thing that's missing? Speaking in tongues. Why is that? They're going to people that already have the same language. That's why. They would not need the ability to speak in languages that they have never studied because they're going to their own countrymen. Now, look at the Great Commission, Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Verse 15, Go into all the world, proclaim or preach the gospel to the whole creation, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. 
Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. You, you read about that in the book of Acts. It's talking about the apostles and those whom the apostles laid their hands upon. In my name they will cast out demons. That's what they did in the limited commission. They will speak with new tongues. They didn't do that in the limited commission. They will speak with new tongues. Why? They're going to all the world. All nations. So that when they would go into a region, you know, that spoke uh, uh, some sort of uh, language, um, they, they would have the supernatural ability to preach in that language. Verse 18 says they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So, of course, you see that with Acts chapter 2. What were the apostles doing when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit? They were speaking in different languages. Because you had Jews there from all over the world for that Jewish feast day of Pentecost who had all these different languages. And so they needed the ability to speak in Phoenician, Ethiopian, or whatever. But in this limited commission in Matthew chapter 10, they didn't need that ability. Because they were going to their own countrymen that spoke the same language. That's further proof that speaking in tongues in the Bible is speaking a human language. It's just not getting up there and rattling some gibberish and saying that's a language from God. That's not what it is. It's a human language that they did not know, they had not studied, and they had the miraculous ability to speak that language. They didn't do that in Matthew chapter 10 because they were going to their own countrymen who spoke the same language. But I thought that was interesting in looking at this, that the, they were going to do basically the same thing except speaking in tongues. They didn't need that ability at this time. That would come later on. We'll get into Matthew chapter 11.